Hello students, uh, it's Professor Paul. Thank you for watching. I'm coming to you from my apartment while we are on quarantine and uh, administering all of our classes online. This video is for my Introduction to Literature classes uh, in English 2342. Uh, and it's the first of several videos that I'll be posting over the coming weeks um, while we are doing all of our classwork online uh, while the coronavirus pandemic um, situation unfolds. Um, so I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank you all for um, your perseverance and flexibility and fortitude in these difficult times. Um, and I do think that although it is a, a trying time, we do have, have reasons to be hopeful. Uh, and I encourage you to remain hopeful as well as, of course, careful and safe in all of your actions and interactions. Uh, before I talk about the subject that um, uh, that I wanted to talk about today, which is the Flannery O'Connor story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, uh, I just want to take a minute to uh, acknowledge the situation that we're in, which is unprecedented, uh, frightening, unsettling, uh, you name it, right? It's it's not a great time right now. Um, as I said, though, there are there are reasons to be hopeful. Uh, but in in such a time, I know it can seem a little absurd to carry on with, you know, schoolwork, uh, talking about short stories and poetry and that sort of thing. And and I'll admit to, to feeling somewhat absurd. Um, it does seem perhaps a bit petty when there are so many other immediate crises that we have to deal with. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that, that I do understand that and that many of you might be feeling like there are other things that you need to be spending your time on. Um, on the other hand, I do think a little bit of routine can be helpful in times of crisis. Uh, it's nice to have something to take your mind off of all the problems that you're dealing with, uh, to have a little slice of regularity in your day, uh, to be able to turn your mind away from the crisis and, and think about something else. Also, I think that in, in times like this, this is when art is most important, when we really need perspective on the world and we need to rethink what our priorities are and question what we take for granted and what we assume is just the natural uh, way of doing things. So um, one thing I'm going to try to do as much as possible um, without making too many radical changes to our, our reading list that would be difficult to accommodate at this point in the semester, but what I want to try to do as much as possible is um, get uh, uh, discuss how, connect whatever we're reading uh, to our current situation. That is, make what we're doing in this class relevant uh, to the crisis, to the pandemic. Um, if not, of course, directly relevant in terms of finding a cure. Uh, but just to give us some perspective, deal with some of the, I think a lot of the stories that, we, that we've got uh, in this class do address issues that are very important for us to think about um, during this time. And in particular, the story that I want to talk about in this video, A Good Man is Hard to Find, uh, I think that, that this video has some really important issues that are very much relevant for, um, for us as we think about what we're going to do, how we're going to respond to this crisis, and not just as individuals or as you know, as students or, or members of the a and Kingsville community, but as human beings, as citizens of the world. Um, what are we going to do to deal with this? How are we going to... Uh, react, um, and I think uh, going forward, uh, you know, what do we what do we want the world to look like? Um, I think a good man is hard to find. Has some really interesting things to say about that topic. So let's talk about the story itself. I think one way that we can read this story is as a story about nostalgia. That is the the longing for the past, for the way things used to be, the sense that. The past was better. We've lost something, some nobility or goodness or uh, decency that, that used to exist but that no longer exists, um, and that, that we've declined into the present. Um, and the title is, you know, is, is essentially communicates that idea. A good man is hard to find. We hear both Red Sammy and the grandmother say that, and their sense is that you know, we can't find good people anymore. People used to be good. People used to be good and honest and decent, but today they've all been corrupted. Uh, the world is is corrupt and sinful. And you might have heard things like this before. For example, in, in movies or TV shows, sometimes uh, someone will say, oh, it's so hard to find good help these days. 
right? The idea that that uh, the people who should be uh, who should know their place and be good servants, it's hard to find people who actually will work for you and and put their all into serving you. Uh, instead, they're just selfish and they want their own. Uh, they they don't really want to work hard for their money and they they just want some something for free. Right or another thing that people you might have heard is oh the idea oh kids these days oh millennials you know back in my day we had it really tough or kids these days they're they're they don't respect their elders they're rude blah 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 um, or you might have heard oh well you know there's no gentleman anymore um, someone if you open the door for for an older lady right they might say oh uh, chivalry isn't dead I see right. Um, all these uh, statements, these these sayings, um, they communicate the same idea of well, the past was better, and the present has lost something of that that goodness and nobility, and they communicate, I think, um, an attitude of superiority. Um, there's a, uh, I think, an often a kind of self centeredness to that. You know, well, in my day, right, it's all about that person's experience and what life was like for them. Uh, and there's often a kind of lack of perspective um, in such uh, uh, sentiments. And I think that's one of the main things this story is about. It's the criticism of that kind of nostalgia, of that longing for the past, especially when that longing, uh, uh, when that past is not quite as good as it seemed to be. Uh, um, or at least it was not necessarily good for everyone, uh, even if it was good for you. The lack of perspective that such sentiments um, reveal, that they express, uh, is is seen when we when we realize a couple very simple points, which is you know if the present is flawed, if our world today, if things are going wrong today, didn't just come out of nowhere, right? These problems developed in the past. Problems today are the result of, of what happened in the past. Kids today are the result of the way their parents raised them and the world that their parents raised them in, the world that their parents helped to create. Um, so if there's something wrong with kids today, uh, as many people like to say in every generation, uh, then it's because of the previous generations. Again, this didn't come out of nowhere. People don't just suddenly become bad. Uh, it's... Things, these are developments that have occurred over time. And of course, the the most obvious question to ask, but that is rarely asked, I think, is, well, if things were so perfect before, if the past was so great, why did it change? If it was so perfect, wouldn't it have just stayed the same? Uh, things change. Time passes. The world transforms. People react to things that occur around uh, around them and not always in the best way. I'm reminded of the Philip Larkin poem that we read, This Be the Verse, Man Hands on Misery to Man, um, right? This sense that uh, the problems of the past are are repeated on the next generation. And uh, again, Larkin's poem uh, is a challenge to the idea of a good man is hard to find because it says, well, if there are good men that are hard to find today, it's because they were very hard. it was very hard to find good men to yesterday or the day before or the century before, right? This is not something, this is not a decline from some past nobility, but rather uh, an ongoing chain of events, of uh, bad decisions often, uh, mistakes, sins, wrongdoings that get multiplied and compounded over the years. Um, now, of course, Larkin's poem is a very grim poem, has a, has a rather darkly humorous ending, and A Good Man is Hard to Find. The story here is also a very, has a, has a dark, uh, darkly comic ending. Um, but I think in their in, in the way it challenges that sense of nostalgia that the past was better and that the present is bad and the people in the present are to blame for that as opposed to uh, being the victims of a long a long chain. I think uh, one of the things that both of these texts invite us to do, the story and the poem, is to think, well, okay, where can we intervene? How can we break that chain of passing on misery uh, uh, from one generation to another? Um, and I think one of the ways that, um, you know, that's one of the things that this story is doing with the critique of nostalgia is it's encouraging us to not always look to the past or to perhaps recognize the ways in which our past uh, 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 continues to cause problems for us in the present and that looking to the past and wanting to return to the past is not a solution. It, it ignores the reality of the problems that we face in, in our uh, uh, real life. So to sum up, um, 
I'm suggesting that we read the story as an analysis uh, or critique of that kind of nostalgia. It shows up the, it reveals to us the blind spots in such nostalgia, the lack of perspective. It um, undermines the kind of self-proclaimed innocence that that uh, this these sentiments express, um, and it also points to the dangers of trying to recapture the past. Uh, the grandmother, of course, is the epitome of this this perspective, right? Um, she frequently complains about the lack of manners and etiquette uh, of her uh, family and other people. Um, she complains that her grandchildren don't have respect for their elders or for their home state. Um, remember her talking about Edgar Allan Teagarden, the suitor from when she was a, a young woman, um, and his courtly manners, uh, right? And she was very impressed by this. This is something that to her is a sign of the, the grace and chivalry of the old days. And there is some evidence in her favor, right? Certainly, she's not wrong about everything she says in terms of saying that, you know, her, her grandchildren, for example, are disrespectful. Um, both June Starr and John Wesley, they, they're little brats. They don't behave all that well. Um, they're rude to her. They're rude to their, their family, the rest of their family. They're disrespectful. Remember June Starr's uh, mockery of, the, of Red Sammy's barbecue? She says, I wouldn't live here for a million bucks. Um... And they're very materialistic, right? That that phrase, a million bucks, June Star says that a couple times, right? And so there's, I think, a sort of implicit comparison between a, a modern money-oriented materialist society where people are, are you know, want to be millionaires, people want money, and that's the, the, the chief marker of value, and um, the, uh, the memories that the grandmother has of a past where money were such, you know, crude or, or materialistic concerns were not uh, the, the top priority in people's minds or they're more concerned with being genteel and polite and kind, etc. Um, and the children also display uh, some, some very childish thrill at the at destruction and chaos, right? When they get into the accident um, about two-thirds of the way through the story, the children are very excited. Oh, we got in an accident. We got in an accident. And then they're disappointed when they learn that no one is, has been killed. Um, and I think one of the, the funniest moments that suggests, you know, that, that kind of in the grandmother's favor shows just how crappy these kids are is that um, once they've encountered the misfit and the grandmother recognizes the misfit and he says, yes, that's who I am, but it would have been better if you hadn't recognized me. Uh, her son Bailey turns to her and curses at her and he says something um, that's really horrible. And the, the narrator says that uh, it's so bad that it even shocks the children, right? Which is as if the children are the most world-weary, crude, uh, experienced of the group, right? You can say something that's, that's bad enough. It's easy to shock the mother. It's easy to shock the father or grandmother. But to shock the children, you got to say something really bad because they've seen it all. Um, so that's, I think, a kind of humorous uh, moment that does support the idea that the, uh, the grandmother says that, you know, kids, these kids are not very well behaved. They are, they are brats. The misfit could also be taken as a sign of the world's corruption and sinfulness. The fact that this heartless killer, this person who kills for, for pleasure, it, it even kills just to kill, doesn't really even seem to enjoy the act of killing, uh, that our world could produce someone like him, that he exists, is uh, a symbol of the corruption in our world, the sinfulness and evil in our world. Um, so he could also be taken as a bit of evidence in support of the grandmother's position. We'll come back to him, though, in a minute to talk about him because he's, he's a little bit more complicated than that. But to talk about the grandmother herself, even though she is correct in many of her observations, she's right about the grandkids. They're brats. They're not good kids. Um, she's very accurate in her description of them. But that doesn't mean that, that her perception of the past and certainly that her perception of herself is all that accurate. Um, she is a clearly superficial character, right? The most obvious example of how superficial she is is when she dresses before their road trip. She makes sure that she wears her fine clothes so that if she's 
killed in an accident, anyone seeing her corpse will know that she's a lady. So what is she most concerned about if in the case of that she dies? Well, that people still know that she was a proper woman, that she was genteel and had good manners and et cetera, et cetera. It's a very shallow kind of uh, concern, right? And it, it shows up her a concern with appearances, not with anything truly deep, uh, not with goodness as a an inner virtue, but appearing good, appearing to be uh, a member of polite society. The grandmother also is manipulative, right? She manipulates at the very beginning of the story. It says that she wants to go to Tennessee rather than Florida, and she'll, she wants to seize on anything that will change her son Bailey's mind about the trip. So this is, she introduces the topic of the misfit as an attempt to scare her son off. Uh, to scare them into going where she wants to go. So she's manipulative. She's, she's uh, not above uh, trying to control others to get what she wants. Um, we also see in her connection with the past, uh, the way in which the past that she longs for was not really uh, all that wonderful, right? She's the character who uses negative racial epithets when she describes uh, African Americans. There's the story about Edgar Allan Teagarden, and she uses a, a, a racial epithet to describe the young black boy who eats the, the watermelon that t uh, her suitor used to bring for her. Um, so she has no qualms about using that kind of language. And then when they're driving, they see a small black child who's um, uh, without pants, without clothes, because he's living in abject poverty. And she thinks it would be a nice picture right? The sight of this, this black child in poverty is something that to her is picturesque. She doesn't think about the, the human suffering, the poverty. She doesn't think about the long legacy of slavery and racism that has led to this child's life. She just thinks, oh, look, how quaint, right? What a, what a picture that I'd love to hang up on my wall. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the strongest signs of, of her just uh, uh, superficial shallowness and her lack of concern for other people. It's something that really makes her look like not a very good person, a rather um, uh, self-centered person. The grandma also makes a rather telling joke when John Wesley asks what happened to all the old plantations. She says, gone with the wind. Right, a reference to the novel and the, the film of the same name, which is about a great plantation, a great southern plantation that was destroyed in the Civil War. So this and, and her other language, I think it, it kind of taints that memory of the past that she longs for, right? When we think, well, what is this South? What is this or what is this past that she that she misses? What are the good old days in her mind? Um, it's the pre-Civil War South. The time of, of a well-mannered, uh, well-dressed, genteel, southern gentlemen and gentle ladies, right? That's what she, she longs for. And all she sees is that legacy. That's what she, all she sees is the beauty, the wealth, the manners, the high society. What she ignores is the suffering that that was built on, that this was all predicated on, was was a result of, or was based on slavery, it was built on the backs of black slaves who were tortured and suffered and killed um, uh, to make this high society, polite life possible. Uh, so I think there's a, a real irony there um, because what she misses is that there is that that legacy does still remain in the racism in the suffering in the poverty of the black child that she sees so um she misses the the uh, uh wealth and the um the appearance of that life uh and she ignores again she doesn't really see the suffering or she doesn't pay attention to it because it's not part of her vision of the of the past all of the grandmother's faults and flaws uh, come to a head um, in their confrontation with the misfit. And um, what leads to that is, again, it's her fault, right? She remembers, she thinks, that there was a nice plantation nearby that she wants to go visit. And she makes up the story about their secret treasure, the hidden gold in the, in the plantation. And it's that lie and her addled memory. It turns out she's in the wrong place. It's not this dirt road. It's in a whole nother state. Um, it's her lies and her bad memory that lead them down the dirt road that ultimately causes their accident um, and their confrontation with the misfit, which leads to all of their deaths. So it's, it's almost as though her desire, this mistaken desire that she has for the past, um, as well as her self-centered um, 
uh, need to try to recapture that past has led to their doom. It's it's they've she's literally taken them down the wrong path, trying to go backwards rather than going forwards. Okay, now let's talk about her actual meeting with the misfit. Um, the grandmother again is the one out of the family who recognizes the misfit. She she says, "I I recognize your picture anywhere," uh, and this makes sense given that she's the one who was. Um, uh, reading uh, uh, the newspaper, so she's seen his picture. But I think there's also a kind of symbolic or figurative sense to this recognition, uh, that there is something between them. There is some closeness between between them. Um, again, not, not on the literal sense, but um, that she sees something in him. She doesn't quite understand it or know what it is yet, but she sees something in him that, that connects them together. And uh, that will will eventually uh, we'll see that connection uh, at the in the final moments of the story. So her pleas to him, she she wants to try to save herself first and her family. Although she really only talks about saving herself, you wouldn't shoot a lady, would you? Um, and her pleas to him are initially based on his appearance. She says he looks like a good man. He doesn't look common. He looks like he's from good people, right? Uh, and because he looks like a good man, she says he wouldn't shoot a lady. A good man, a gentleman, wouldn't shoot a gentle woman, wouldn't shoot a lady, right? Um, so her definition of good, and of course we can we can say that what she's doing here is is motivated by her desire to to survive, right? She'll say anything. Most people would probably say anything uh, if faced with certain death, uh, flatter their their uh, captors how, any way that they could in order to survive. But again. The way she defines good, it's more about class and status or lineage, right? You come from good people. You don't come from common people. It has nothing to do with morality. It's about she's trying to appeal to him on the sense of, well, we're of the same class. We're on the same level. So if I'm a good person, you're a good person, you wouldn't hurt me, right? So once more, we see how superficial the grandmother is. Just as before when she had been concerned to dress like a lady so that if she uh, were killed in an accident, people would know that she's a lady just by looking at her, she's judging the misfit based on appearance, on how he looks, not on the nature of his character. Now, um, her and the misfit have this long conversation where they talk about his past, they talk about uh, religion and Jesus and miracles, and she's throughout trying to convince him that he is a good person, that he doesn't need to kill her and her family. And of course, while this is going on, um, the members of her, her family are being killed one at a time uh, by the misfit's henchmen. And the conversation itself is really fascinating and there's a lot to talk about there, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about that in this video. What I want to focus on is the last moment when um, she says she recognizes him as one of her own children. She says, you're one of my own babies. And um, as she reaches out to touch him, this is the moment that he finally uh, shoots her, kills her. Um, and this, this moment of recognition is one of the most crucial and debated moments in the story, right? What is happening here? What does this mean? Why does she say this? What causes her to say this? And uh, what causes the misfit to react the way he does? Uh, you know, one explanation is that she's hysterical. She's heard uh, the gunshots as each member of her family has been gunned down uh, in the woods around her. She's hysterical. She wants to survive. Uh, she's an old lady. And so perhaps her just brain addled uh, or her addled brain um, addled by fear and confusion causes her to say something crazy, make this mistake. And, you know, the fact that he's wearing her dead son's Hawaiian shirt now suggests that, you know, that this is a possibility that she's just losing her mind. She's she's hallucinating almost. Um, another explanation is that this is an attempt to emotionally manipulate him, right? She's pretending that, oh, I, you know, she's pretending to have some sort of concern for him, pretending to reach out to him and connect with him in order to try to save herself. Or maybe, again, to appear like a crazy, harmless old woman so he'll take pity on her. There's also the idea that maybe this is a true moment of human connection. Maybe at this final moment, right before her death, um, when she's brought to the brink of that of of, of that moment, uh, and she has nothing left, that at this final moment she she finally makes 
a connection with another human per- being, sees him not just as the misfit, not just the superficiality of him, but sees him as a person in the way that she didn't, for example, see the poor little black child with uh, no clothes. She saw him as just a subject for a picture. Now the misfit becomes a real person to her in a way that really no one else in the story has been. Um, so those are some of the most uh, uh, you know, common interpretations, and I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong. Um, they each have their own power, and they each uh, have their own uh, validity and tell us something uh, about the story. Um, and I'd like to suggest another uh, idea, another option for what's happening here, is that perhaps this is recognition not just of, of him as a fellow human, but of her role and part in creating the world that created him, right? Just as she made Bailey the man he was, and we know that her son Bailey is not a, a great guy, right? He doesn't have, uh, he's not a, a very happy person. He seems very gruff, um, not super pleasant, doesn't seem to take much interest in his kids or his wife. Um, so she made him who he was. And in the same way, she's she's made the misfit who he was, indirectly speaking, um, as a participant in the world that he grew up in, as one of the people who set the standards that he failed to live up to. Um, it's almost perhaps an acknowledgement or recognition and acceptance of her guilt, of the guilt that she'd been ignoring before, right? Of her own recognition, maybe of her own faults and her superficiality, that that's what's brought her to this last moment. After he's killed her, the misfit uh, makes a comment that I think really um, illuminates the the grandmother's character, uh, her hypocrisy and her superficiality. That is that that she would have been a good woman if someone had held a gun to her head her whole life, right? Um, that is what made her good in this final moment. Any any goodness that she showed in this final moments of her life was not because she was a good person not because she wanted to be good or wanted to do good or it was part of her character, but because she was forced to do it, because she had to do it. There was quite literally a gun to her head. With this comment, the misfit raises uh, an important philosophical philosophical question about morality and, and our motivations for it, um, which is, are you a good person because someone told you to be good? Because your parents tell you to and you're afraid of getting in trouble because you're afraid of breaking the law, because you're afraid of being punished by God. Is that why you treat others with respect? Is that why you don't break the law? Is that why you um, do good deeds? Or do you do them because you believe in it? Because you authentically choose to do good? Do you go and feed the poor just so you can hopefully get some bonus points with God? Or do you do it because you really want to help those people? Right? Where does your goodness come from? Is it something that you do, something that you choose to do, something that you believe in, or is it something that you do out of obligation? And if you are merely being good out of obligation, are you truly being good? I think that's the question that the misfit asks. Um, And uh, although he is clearly not himself a, a moral person in certain respects, um, he does function in this story to, to show up the illusory nature of, of many people's goodness, right? That it is a facade, that it is superficial. Um, his exposure of the grandmother's superficiality at the end, that uh, it took his gun to make her a good person, uh, I think is a very harsh critique of that that kind of the, the worldview that she embodies, that idea of um, appearance, of genteel manners, of politeness, of of being of appearing to be a good person and showing yourself as as a properly well-mannered person the misfit is really puncturing that quite literally with his bullets um to show that it's it's fake it's not true goodness uh and so the good man is hard to find yes that's true uh and it's even harder to find a good man not just because the world has has gotten worse or anything like that not because manners are changed or people are less polite but it's always been very hard to find a good man, someone who truly chooses to be good, who believes in what they do based on their own sense of right and wrong, rather than because they want to conform to appearances or because they don't want to be punished uh, in this life or in the next life, right? That's goodness out of obligation. And I think one of the things that the story is suggesting is that that's not enough. That's not true goodness. 
I'd like to end by trying to connect this story and these issues to our current real world situation. Um, we are in an election year in a very contested uh, and a very passionate and uh, 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 divisive election. Um, we are in the middle of a global pandemic. We don't know what's going to happen day to day. Uh, we do know that the world is changing and that on the other side of this pandemic and on the other side of our election, the world is going to be a very different place. And that's scary. That's unsettling. Um, and it's easy. I think one of the most natural human reactions in times of uncertainty is to long for the familiar, to long for a return to the way things were, to simplicity, uh, to the good old days. Oh, if only we could go back to the day before this pandemic broke out. Wouldn't, wouldn't life be perfect if we could just go back to that? That's the kind of attitude that the grandmother displays, right? If we could only go back to the past. And in this story, that attitude quite literally gets people killed, right? She has this mistaken idea of how good things were in the past, um, and that leads them down the wrong path, quite literally and figuratively, and it leads to their doom. And I think in our current uh, uh, political and economic and social moment, people, there are certain people, and, and often they are of the older generations, who wish that they could keep things as they were. Uh, because, of course, change is probably most unsettling to the older generations uh, because things are, uh, you know, they are furthest away from their childhoods um, and uh, changes that happen uh, affect them more than others because they, they are close, more closely tied to the past. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should let those uh, old views dominate the way we, we live our lives. And, of course, again, as I've said, if the past was so perfect, why did things change? Um, we need to be careful of, of thinking, of assuming that the world is de in decline or that the world is, is just naturally getting better. Either way, the world is changing and how it's changing, we never can really know until after the fact. So in a time like this, we, we have an option. We can continue doing things the way we were before. We could try to get back to the status quo. We can try, we can continue uh, the economic and environmental and political uh, policies that have led us to where we are. Because of course it is the world that we lived in before that led us to the pandemic. It is the world that we lived in before that led to a, a president like Donald Trump. Um, it's the world that we lived in before that led to our environmental and economic crises that we face today. So we can continue behaving as we were, or we can try to take a look at our world and, and really see the things that we have ignored before, see the things that past generations have uh, not wanted to deal with. We can continue to follow the old ways and, and follow the old imperatives, or we can choose to make a new life, make a new world, transform the world in a way that will uh, protect the most vulnerable, that will prevent um, such crises, that will hopefully uh, be a more humane future rather than one that uh, idealizes some false image of the past and ignores the realities and, and the real legacy of that past uh, in creating our modern world. All right, let me just briefly sum up um, what I've talked about today. Um, a good man is hard to find. We've looked at the character of the grandmother as the expression, the epitome of a nostalgic worldview, a longing for the past, but a mistaken worldview that uh, relies on superficiality, that's, that takes uh, up the appearance of goodness to be real goodness when uh, it can, it's merely a facade, it's merely a hollow image rather than, than true goodness. Um, and I've argued that the story can be seen as a critique of that kind of nostalgia and that that's important for us today to, to beware of our own nostalgia and beware of just saying, uh, uh, of ignoring our problems and not dealing with the realities of the world around us and just blithely and blindly continuing business as usual. Um, I will continue to post some other videos later this week for my students uh, on the other stories that we've read. Um, I hope that this video was helpful. Uh, if you have any questions, you know how to email me. You know how to contact me via email. Uh, I will also, of course, be holding regular office hours during uh, online office hours during uh, the quarantine situation. Um, again, I 
thank you all for your perseverance, for your flexibility, for your fortitude, um, and for your hopefulness as we go forward. Uh, I will do my best to uh, keep everyone on track to help you with whatever I can in terms of making sure that you're successful in this class um, going forward. Again, please contact me if there's anything I can help you with. Otherwise, I wish you the day you wish yourselves, and I will see you in the next video. Take care.